Hi, everyone. Hope everyone is doing well this evening. Uh, I'm Yves Engler. This is the Canadian Foreign Policy Hour, which is a critical look at Canada's role abroad. A weekly update. Uh, this is about the 80, 80 or 90th uh, uh, session of the Foreign Policy Hour. I'm coming to you from uh, Jojage, which has long been a meeting place of various First Nations otherwise known as uh, Montreal. Hope everyone is doing uh, well this evening. So uh, this week, uh, again, there's lots of developments in um, uh, Canada's foreign policy. There was a story in the Na uh, New York Times about titled he uh, Off of Heels of Drought, Floods Devastate East Africa. Uh, almost certainly uh, exacerbated by uh, greenhouse gas emissions and human-induced uh, uh, climate change. And of course, Canada is a uh, leading per capita emitter. This week, the Canadian ambassador at the UN, Bob Ray, voted against a resolution uh, sponsored by the African group uh, calling for a new global uh, tax system to lessen corporations' ability to transfer price to minimize uh, their their tax payments. Um, the French economist uh, Piketty he tweeted about, about it how this was a big uh, big victory. It passed 125 uh, to 48. Uh, of course, Canada opposed. Uh, this is not the first time that. Uh, Bob Ray or Canadian officials have voted against efforts at the UN General Assembly to uh, lessen the inequities in global affairs. Um, but um, but this is a pattern that uh, that continues. And uh, the Globe and Mail business section had a story about uh, Scotia Bank, which maybe offers a little bit of insight into why Canada votes against efforts to uh, reform global tax uh, policies and votes against UN efforts to uh, lessen global inequities. And it's basically about Scotiabank's uh, operations in Latin America, specifically uh, Scotiabank, according to the story, which I, I knew had about uh, 50, operated in 50 countries a decade ago. It's down a bit, it's down to about 30. Um, it's down to about 30. Uh, but as the story points out, that its focus on four markets in Latin America contributed uh, Peru, Mexico, Colombia, and Chile. Um, they represent now a third of Scotiabank's revenue in the most recent quarter. So Scotiabank and other Canadian banks have long been major uh, international players uh, uh, and they make a lot of their profits from their uh, their global uh, operations, uh, and that goes back, uh, you know, more than a century, particularly in the um, in the Caribbean. Uh, Scotia Bank, they 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 follow the trade between the um, the maritime provinces and. Um, and the slave trade and the slave plantation economies where cod was sent from the Maritimes down to the uh, slave plantations in uh, Jamaica, well, in an earlier period in Saint-Domingue, uh, now Haiti, and uh, the other, most of the British uh, co colonies and uh, Canadian banking relations uh, with the Caribbean go back uh, to the late 1800s and they, they follow uh, that trade um, that was going on uh, with the slave plantation economies. So Canadian banks are major global uh, players. The, um, the US, uh, the, the assassination of, um, of uh, Sikh uh, activist in uh, Vancouver area uh, a few months ago, uh, the US is, is um, uh, pressing India 
on uh, alleged plot to kill another U.S. Canadian uh, uh, Sikh uh, activist uh, in the U.S. Um, so we haven't heard a lot of, of details about the accusations that Canada made against the, the Modi government in India about what exact evidence there is of India's involvement in uh, Nijar's assassination. But, um, but we, uh, now the Americans are saying there's another, uh, there's another attempt um, uh, plot by the Indian government, which gives some credence, greater credence to, uh, to Trudeau's uh, accusations. There's a story about how the Canadian government military is delaying the purchase of uh, the five billion dollar purchase of uh, Reaper drones uh, until those drones can be showed that they that they can operate in the Arctic. In this story, it talks about how the U.S. State Department approved uh, Canada purchasing 219 Hellfire missiles. And, and other weapons and radars for the drones for worked out to $313 million. So these are going to be uh, well-armed drones uh, that will be able to uh, uh, kill lots of people. In the National Post, um, I think it's uh, Ibbotson, had a piece titled, Canada can't defend democracy when the military is out of cash, um, which is beyond absurd but is taken sort of for granted in our media sphere. The Canadian military's objective, of course, is nothing to do with uh, defending democracy. And that's uh, uh, very much the case internationally. Uh, for instance, they helped overthrow democracy in Haiti in 2004, and they've helped uh, advance Western US-led geostrategic interests in many places. Um, but it's not even true in Canada. And in fact, if you look at the history of the Canadian military in terms of uh, suppressing uh, labor strikes, uh, going back to the, uh, to the, uh, uh, the militia, uh, in terms of suppressing, uh, uh, obviously, indigenous uh, uh, sovereignty movements, uh, also uh, Quebecois uh, nationalist uh, uh, protest, so the Canadian military is definitely not a, a force for democracy, but that is what it's framed as in our, in our major media outlets. There's a story about the, the US, there's a bill in the US um, for sharing artificial intelligence with the five eyes. And the breaking defense uh, media outlet quotes the former head of Pentagon's uh, it, uh, AI center saying, if we want to fight as a system, you have to start sharing technology now. So saying that basically a potential war with China is coming and we need to share our artificial intelligence, military capacities with the other uh, five eyes countries is essentially what's being, what's being said. Um, and that just adds to this weight of the five eyes, Canada uh, as a, uh, uh, preparing for um, uh, uh, a war with China. The Globe had a front page piece uh, complaining about Huawei having um, funding some uh, AI labs in Alberta, despite federal restrictions. And uh, so some projects that had been in the works have allowed to have been allowed to continue going forward. And uh, it's part of the whole globe's uh, panic. Again, I, you know, I, I'm very comfortable with criticism of how corporations have get these good deals with academia. They put up a few million bucks, some sort of amount of money, and they get to take advantage of the publicly funded uh, university structure. And often the, the companies end up with the, the benefits from that research uh, relationship. Uh, so I'm, I'm I'm very keen on that discussion, uh, but in this case, it's it's just all part of this scary Chinese, scary Chinese, scary Chinese companies, um, uh, and fits the geopolitical uh, uh, game. There was a bunch of stories this week, uh, kind of following following out from the 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 two Michaels story about them being um, one accusing the other of of being. 
uh, partly responsible for, for his detention based upon spying. And the stories talked about in the globe, uh, uh, something called the Global Security Reporting Program. I wasn't familiar with this program and apparently it began after uh, 9-11, not the, not the one in Chile, but the one in the US. And um, it basically, it's, it's, Canada doesn't have a foreign spying uh, uh, entity like uh, the CIA or, or uh, M MI6 in Britain. And, and so they, this, this uh, global affairs initiative of um, apparently, and I think they said 30 countries, these global security reporting program agents are involved in intelligence gathering. Uh, the, the government says this is, this is um, they don't pay, they're not like, they're not uh, uh, sort of seeking, uh, I don't know, moles or, or um, I don't know what you would call maybe more traditional espionage, but it's more sort of open source uh, type of, type of uh, intelligence gathering. Uh, uh, Michael Spavro, uh, Spaver, again, uh, who, who I think is accusing Michael Kovrig, who was a global security reporting program uh, official. Uh, <clears throat> Michael Spavor was, um, went to North Korea a lot. And I guess Michael Kovrig was, was uh, talking to him and getting, trying to get intelligence about North Korea as part of this program, which apparently shares with the Five Eyes, uh, CSIS obviously as well. And um, <clears throat> so there's this, this global securities reporting program that exists. Um, there's a really funny piece from, from uh, Guy Saint-Jacques, who is the former Canadian ambassador in China, who's uh, one of the go-to people for the establishment sort of anti-China uh, media uh, uh, journalists and outlets. And he writes, he wrote an op-ed in The Globe uh, saying, titled, more than anything, Michael Spavor was the victim of a coercive Beijing. And so he's sort of basically uh, criticizing indirectly Spavor for, for launching this lawsuit against the other Michael uh, for uh, contributing to his, uh, his detention in, in China. But in this piece, Guy Saint-Jacques claims that the, uh, this global security reporting program, um, that what they were concerned about, that they were interested about in China was, he said, the human rights, the ability of Uyghurs to worship their mother Muslim faith and their rapport with the Han Chinese in Xinjiang um, would have been the main interests for the, this uh, Canadian spying program. You have to be the most juvenile uh, 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 individual to believe that the Canadian government was their their spying program in China. What they were concerned about was the rights of 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 uh, the Uyghurs to to uh, practice their their faith. Um, that they were their central concern was human rights in China. It's just a level of 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 um, absurdity. Uh, but this is what what goes to pass for in uh, in official Canadian. Uh, 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 intelligent, I should say, global male, intelligent, um, sophisticated uh, 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 media circles. Uh, <clears throat> in the globe as well, Andrew Coyne, who also is a, uh, a CBC, uh, one of the most influential CBC commentators, he, he has a piece about coming out of the Halifax Security Forum, uh, which is... Uh, which is, uh... oh, can no one start the video? I, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll see what I did there. Oh, that's why, I was wondering what was going on here. Apologies for that. Um, okay, I, I tried to say, say people aren't allowed to unmute themselves, but instead I, I did the video. Apologies, and I, I was kind of wondering what was going on, it seemed a bit different than usual. Um, but, uh, so Andrew Coyne has a piece in the in the Globe, uh, coming out of his Halifax Security Forum, uh, participating in the Halifax Security Forum, and that's really the, a, the central point of the Halifax Security Forum, is bringing all these neocons together, and then bringing the sort of neocon media journalists together, and they they listen to the 
influential uh, politicians, uh, think tank types, and then they, of course, report it to us in these um, important outlets like the Globe and Mail. And Coyne, uh, he says, he talks about basically, it's all one front. All these wars are one, this is all one front. Uh, we are not at war on several fronts, but one is the, is the headline. And he refers to something called the Crinks, which is China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea. Um, some really, really smart person came up with that one. Um, and, uh, and in his piece, he, he talks about how, quote, how much stomach the West shows for the fights in Ukraine and the Middle East for staying with them, that is, for the long haul, will in turn be an important factor in whether China eventually decides to invade Taiwan. So whether we back Israel uh, incinerating, you know, 20, 30, 50, I don't know, maybe 100,000 Palestinians in Gaza, if we don't back that, then China is going to take the message that they can, uh, they can invade Taiwan. Uh, and I guess also simultaneously, if we don't, uh, um, you know, back more and more and more and more NATO proxy war, uh, same thing, China's going to take that as they can invade uh, Taiwan. And presumably when another war pops up, if we don't back whatever they, whatever the neocons want, China's going to, of course, take that as, as a sign of our weakness and, uh, and is going to invade Taiwan because of that. Um, on the Ukraine file, uh, there are a number of developments. Um, I, uh, the Globe had a piece titled... Uh, Recent deaths of Canadian volunteer fighters in Ukraine illustrate ferocity of the new Russian counter, new Russian offensive attacks. So there have been three Canadians killed in the past 10 days, according to the Globe, uh, as of a couple of days ago, uh, fighting in the, in the, uh, the foreign uh, uh, unit there in, in, in Ukraine. And uh, the Canadian government announced uh, $60 million in new, uh, mostly in um, machine guns and, and ammunition. Uh, Colt Canada is going to make a bunch of money from this. Uh, the, the also uh, uh, Bill Blair, uh, the defense minister, he made this, uh, we're going to stand with Ukraine till the end, a speech at the Halifax Security Forum to the Ukrainian Canadian Congress, which I believe I mentioned uh, last week. Um, the more interesting one this week was uh, the, the liberals we really went hard hard against the conservatives for voting against the Canada Ukraine free trade agreement. And there were these, these statements of like moral outrage from these liberal uh, ministers. Uh, Trudeau said, uh, the real story is the rise of a right wing American MAGA influence thinking that has made Canadian uh, conservatives uh, used to be among the strongest defenders of Ukraine, I'll admit, turn their backs on some U on Ukraine in its hour of need. And um, so they're basically trying to paint uh, Pierre Polyèvre as, as sort of a Trumpian. And of course, some of the Trumpian kind of base has, has soured on the NATO proxy war. And they went really hard on that. Uh, and a bunch of the people like Andrew Coyne, uh, Ibbotson, a bunch of the people who are pretty conservative uh, commentators in the Canadian media, um, basically said this was an example of how Poliev is not acting prime ministerial uh, uh, and, and, you know, kind of reflecting this, some of that criticism of, of Trump as, you know, the deep state being a little uh, uncomfortable with Trump's looseness within, you know, how he follows the, 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 the NATO militarist kind of uh, agenda. Um, and, and, I, and I don't think that Polyev is somebody who's going to change Canadian foreign policy. I think he's probably going to be uh, worse, if anything, than, uh, than uh, Trudeau. But, but, uh, but nonetheless, this sort, of, this sort of panic about this um, conservative position. And um, Maxime Bernier, one of the stories quoted Maxime Bernier, uh, the head of the People's Party, saying that uh, we should be supporting this destructive proxy war between the U.S. and Russia. And um, um, so there's, uh, there's some of that going on. Now, simultaneously, there's a couple developments. I did an interview with uh, Ivan uh, Kachanovsky, which you can check out on the, the YouTube channel. 
um, about uh, a couple of developments uh, it, taking place. The one was the head of Zelensky's uh, Servant of the People Party and the head of the Ukrainian delegation for the peace negotiations with Russia uh, um, a few weeks into the war. He came out on uh, the major Ukrainian TV station and he said that, yeah, there was a deal. We basically had a deal. And uh, the main issue of the deal was neutrality, Ukraine staying out of NATO, and, uh, and that the, the, it was scuttled by Boris Johnson, by, by the British. This is just confirming what we already knew, but this is coming from the head of the Ukrainian delegation. So, I mean, there's nobody would be maybe Zelensky himself, but aside from that, nobody's better, uh, uh, you know, more credible source. Uh, on this, and he's just confirming what had been reported by the Israeli Prime Minister Bennett, uh, the Turkish Foreign Minister Putin himself, uh, a number of other you know media reports. Uh, um, but so he said that, and so um, that's interesting. And he also said, uh, which Kachinovsky pointed out in, in the interview, but it, it, I don't know if he mentioned this on his Twitter, uh, that that the the U Ukrainian uh, um, official also said that Russia's withdrawal from around Kyiv, that in fact, that was part of the negotiations. And um, so the implication here is that the Russians weren't actually defeated there. They withdrew as part of sort of like a confidence kind of measure um, uh, tied to coming to, to an agreement. Uh, and that, I think, is, is a little bit of a, I'm not sure if that's been reported. I, I assume people speculate about that. I'm not sure um, um, if that has been uh, reported. And the implications of it are somewhat important because it gets to this whole point of the fact that does, does Ukraine have a credible chance of defeating Russia? And if they did, if they did defeat Russian forces, or if they forced Russian forces to withdraw there, uh, then that would that kind of fed this this narrative of you know oh, Ukraine can win this and it's 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 realistic to defeat Russian forces and this and that um, that kind of uh, strengthens that 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 notion and if it was actually more of based upon um, some sort of agreement then that kind of undercuts that and it it says something about um, uh, Ukraine's possibility in uh, in the counteroffensive and whatnot. Now at this point. It's clear the Ukrainian counteroffensive has, has failed, and um, but um, and 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 now at this point, um, what what is kind of clear from this is that Ukraine was in a much better position before uh, you know a few weeks in, and now um, there's basically no scenario where Ukraine is not going to give up a bunch of territory. In the previous scenario, it was a matter of uh, basically, you know, Russia keeping Crimea. And and um, and going, you know, neutrality. Uh, now, realistically, at least in the short to medium term, uh, Russia is going to be keeping control of a significant chunk of of Ukrainian uh, uh, territory. The other thing that I talked to uh, uh, Kachinovsky about uh, was um, the the. Uh, so this was a t we just passed the ten year anniversary of the beginning of the Maidan protests. And the Globe had it on the front page on Wednesday, had a picture on the front page titled Ukraine's Decade of Devastation. And, um, and basically about the, uh, the Maidan massacre trial. And what he's saying, the University of Ottawa professor is saying, is that the trial, which got almost no attention in Western media, he, he's saying it really confirms what he'd been saying. They, they confirmed that uh, journalists and protesters were shot at from the hotel that the Maidan pro protesters, the right wing forces, controlled. And so the killing uh, was not the Yanukovych government uh, demanding the, the police, the Bakhmut or whatever you pronounce it, um, uh, killing protesters, but in fact, this was uh, principally. Uh, violence coming from the the protesters with the intent, presumably, of of um, creating this this situation that led to the the unraveling of the of the government. 
and uh, and that of course is uh, is uh, of of quite significant in, in, import because that's part of what spurred um, Russia's invasion um, and uh, this uh, horrible war we've been seeing. Um, so uh, shifting gears to Palestine, the the uh, uh, we have, we probably had the biggest. Palestine, certainly the biggest Palestine demonstration ever in Ottawa on Saturday. Uh, some reports say 100,000. Uh, I've seen uh, the images of Parliament. I didn't go, uh, but I've seen, it. I've seen images of Parliament. I've seen images of a, of a uh, time-lapsed uh, video, and I've seen an, another image from above a building, and I, I can't see any way it's less than 50,000. Uh, very well could have been 100,000. Uh, clearly a huge demonstration and presumably a lot of people traveled. I know there were buses from Windsor, London, obviously Toronto, Kingston, Montreal. So people travel from pretty far away uh, to attend as well. And um, and uh, this is, I, to be honest with you, I, I, when I heard about the March on Ottawa, I was a little uh, skeptical. I thought that after demonstrations every weekend uh, that it was going to be difficult to, you know, really get, you know, if I thought if there was 20,000 people, that would be a success. And clearly there's, there was way more than 20,000 people. Um, and it was not just a success, but it was a really, uh, uh, you know, a grand slam, if you like. And, um, and uh, so congrats, congrats to uh, the organizers, the Palestinian youth movement and, and others who were, who were uh, leading the charge. Um, so this is just the, the uh, this is it probably, it could be, I, I, I was, like, I don't think Ottawa had a, had a Iraq war demo that was that big. I'm pretty sure it didn't. Montreal did. Uh, I don't even know if Toronto did. Um, but so this demonstration in Ottawa was, there's been there was one in Montreal a couple of weeks ago. There was one week later in Toronto, and this one in Ottawa. They all seemed, I think, kind of in the same range, 50, 70, 100,000. That seems um, um, kind of range. Uh, this was probably may have been the biggest anti-war demo in, in Ottawa's history. I'm not sure. It might be one in, during Vietnam. There might be one during the the nuclear uh, uh, protest. Probably wasn't on Iraq. Uh, so this could have been the biggest anti-war demonstration in Ottawa's history, certainly the biggest Palestine demonstration. And this flows from, you know, there's a whole bunch of other, this is going on, you know, that petition, that the ceasefire petition, biggest, they say it just ended, 286,719 uh, signatures, by far the biggest ever parliamentary petition. You had uh, people blockading uh, the entrances of Lockheed Martin and Bombardier here in Montreal, train in Winnipeg. You had protesters uh, rush the Liberal Party fundraiser in Ottawa, I think last Tuesday, when Trudeau was in St. John's, Newfoundland. They, uh, they protested uh, when he was meeting with uh, the EU, uh, von der Leyen, um, and two different things, two different things. They had dozens, at least according to the Globe Mail, dozens of protesters. I saw some video of them heckling uh, Trudeau. Um, you have at McGill, I mentioned, I think it just broke after last week's session, but I mentioned it, uh, the, 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 the vote was going on. McGill students voted 78.7% for a resolution of genocide, uh, no to genocide policy. It says A part of it says university immediately cut ties with any corporations, institutions, or individuals complicit in genocide, settler colonialism, apartheid, or ethnic cleansing against Palestinians. And it was the biggest turnout in uh, SSMU, the student uh, union uh, history, 35% of students turned out, which was more than, so when they got a Palestine solidarity resolution, the last referendum back in, I guess, March of uh, 2022, um, they, they got 71% to vote for it, but they, the Israel lobby people hyped up the fact that it was like, 17% of students turned out. This was more than double that. And the proportion of support for Palestine was even higher. So it went totally against the, uh, the claims of the, the Israel lobby types who were saying that it was, it was only because of low turnout that the, the, there was so much backing uh, for, the, for the resolution. 
but the day after, the day after the student union uh, passes this resolution overwhelmingly, B'nai B'rith <laughs> goes to court, gets a, a judge. It's a little bit unclear what, what exactly, how they were able to pull this off. Um, but they basically get a ruling and, and the student union sort of uh, 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 um, accedes to this, saying that they, until there's a decision, a judge uh, uh, decides on this, that the student union won't adopt the policy. So, so there's a referendum vote, and then the student union has to go through some, like the judicial board has to okay it, and then the council has to okay it, and that if it aligns with the, um, the procedures of the union. Uh, so the judge, so there's an agreement now that it's basically pushed off until March 24th, when the the uh, the judge is going to hear this uh, hear this out. Um, so huge success, and then the Israel lobby in their legal uh, shenanigans, um, they figure out a way of of kind of causing uh, stunting stunting the uh, the process as they've done. Of course, previously in previous resolutions, um, there's a whole bunch of stories, a whole bunch of developments on the on the repression front. Uh, uh, Humber College, uh, somewhere I think in the suburbs of Toronto, uh, the student got got uh, got uh, uh, kicked out, kicked off of campus. I think PhD student uh, because they were putting up uh, boycott Israeli apartheid stickers. Because of course that's uh, that's uh, anti-Jewish. Um, the 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 indigenous the head of the um, AGO, which is the is that the Toronto Art Gallery of Art, or Art Gallery of Ontario, um, the indigenous curator uh, was basically pushed out because she was supporting uh, uh, Palestinian cause. There's a story in the Globe. Uh, front page Globe story said Ontario school school workers face investigations over posts about Middle East, and they, they go through a whole series of cases of different uh, teachers or, or uh, school officials who are being um, uh, targeted because they don't like uh, uh, Israel's genocidal policies. There was a really intense uh, uh, criminalization of Palestine solidarity. Where early in the morning on Wednesday, the House of, I think it was seven different uh, activists uh, in Toronto were between 4 30 a.m. and 6 a.m. The police uh, searched the houses, arrested people, cuffed basically everyone in the house, uh, people who had nothing to do with what they were going at. And this was all based upon, uh, this was like a big, like coordinated, apparently there was eight police at each, at each uh, uh, house, uh, big coordinated all over putting up posters on the Indigo uh, bookstore about uh, Heather Reisman and her uh, funding genocide. And uh, this is an absolutely outrageous police overreach. And the the they put up some fake blood. All of this was taken off pretty easily by uh, Indigo officials. It may not even be vandalism. I know that if you if 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 it can be removed easily enough, it's not even actually vandalism. I, I you know I don't know the ins and outs of the legalese on that. Um, but at at worst, this is vandalism, which I I don't know a ticket. I was at a ticket for a couple hundred a couple hundred dollar fine. I don't know what the standard. Uh, uh, vandalism ticket would be, but they they treated this with they, they even busted down houses. Apparently, they got one of the houses wrong. The person hadn't lived there in like twenty months, and they busted in on these, these uh, people who just live there, <laughs> uh, all over posters, right? Putting up posters, um, political posters, and uh, so the Globe had this on the front page. Uh, it was titled uh, Toronto Police Lay Charges in Indigo Store Vandalism as Hate Cases Soar. Okay, so in this story about hate cases, right? The hate, the hate out there. Um, the, it, the, it's about uh, 
the story admits that Heather Reisman uh, set up a charity for non to, to fund non-Israelis to join the Israeli military, which is the central element in targeting Heather Reisman, which is there was a long-standing boycott of, of Indigo chapters. Uh, Reisman also is, of course, you know, she set, set up the Center for Israel and Jewish Affairs. There's other reasons beyond the Hessek Foundation to, to target her, but the targeting uh, of her has been focused, and, and the boycott of Indigo has been focused on the Hessek Foundation. Bernie Farber, so being quoted as the founder of the Canada Anti-Hate Network, he calls this, this, uh, this postering of, of uh, Chapters Indigo, or of an Indigo story, he calls it a, quote, classic case <laughs> of anti-Semitism. And he says it's uh, links it to uh, Kristallnacht, okay, where the beginning of the the Nazis uh, uh, murder campaign. Um, I don't know what what do you say when they when people say this is a classic case. I mean, uh, you don't. I don't know how you even you know have a conversation with uh, with people like that. Um, now, what's been lost in I wrote a piece uh, detailing this out. What's been lost in the in the has the Reisman stuff. The media has reported about her funding Hessek and the non-Israelis to join the Israeli military. They have there's some media, most of it they've kind of ignored it in just calling it a, you know, a hate incident or whatever. But there's been some reporting on that. But what there hasn't been any reporting on, uh, I did an interview with uh, Shane Martinez about this on posted to YouTube. It got very wide circulation on the CFPI and my YouTube channels. Um, and uh, the the, the, it's a Hesek is a registered charity, so this is we're subsidizing this in com clear violation of Canada Revenue Agency rules around for, supporting foreign militaries, and so so they've given about a hundred million, uh, maybe a bit more, over the past uh, 17, 18 years, uh, Reisman and uh, her husband Jerry Schwartz, and and. Probably because they're obviously in the high tax bracket. Uh, you're not exactly sure, but it depends on how it works. But you can get 40, I, I think in some case can be even almost like 50% of, of, of it is essentially write off. So we've been giving, the Canadian taxpayers giving like $40 million <laughs> to this charity that has a whole bunch of like, you know, former Mossad and IDF officials sitting on the board that is basically inducing. Uh, Canadians, Americans, Parisians, wherever, to go join the Israeli military. And, and, uh, and it's designed in part to put pressure on Israelis. It's a way of like, hey, these people from Vancouver are going to come kill Palestinians. How dare you be uncomfortable with killing Palestinians? Right? That's part of the uh, intent of the Hesek, the whole lone soldiers, from the standpoint of the Israeli military. And we're, this is subsidized. Now, now, in this piece I write, so it's absolute crystal clear that Hessek is violating CRA rules. Uh, and, and of course, this, these subsidies, uh, the Toronto police aren't actually responsible for the CRA. That's the CRA is negligence. Um, but, but, but there's a good case to be made that Hessek is actually violating the Foreign Enlistment Act because the Foreign Enlistment Act says you're inducing Canadians to join another country's military is a violation. And by providing scholarships, huge amounts of money for a Vancouverite to join the Israeli military, that when you get out, you get all these scholarships and bursaries and uh, 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 all your education will be paid for, et cetera, you can make a good case that that's a form of inducing to join uh, uh, the Israeli military. And it's, it's taking on some of what the Israeli military um, would be financing. Uh, obviously, you know, one of the ways that Americans, you hear about this a lot, induced to join the, the US military is by offering educational opportunities, et cetera. Um, so basically the point of my piece is that it's Heather Reisman that should be uh, uh, detained. The, the, the Toronto police should go into her Rosedale mansion. Apparently it's the, it's the, um, the most expensive house in Toronto. They, like, they bought like three other mansions around it and ripped them down and then expanded their house and whatever it's, I don't know, 20, 50, 40, whatever million dollar uh, house. But well, I'm expecting that the Toronto police will bust in in the middle of the middle of the morning to uh, Reisman's Rosedale mansion, take all her personal phones and laptops, 
sequester them, sequester her car, like they apparently did to one of the uh, the activists, uh, impounded the car for multiple days, and uh, and uh, you know put her up on charges, uh, arrest all the, the the house help. I'm assuming there's, there's many uh, many uh, servants working there. Arrest them all, um, uh, or detain or cuff them all, like they apparently did to the activists' families, um, and uh, and uh, you know pursue her for uh, uh, for violation of the Foreign Enlistment Act. Un unlikely that's going to happen, but uh, we can hope. <laughs> um, so on the there's on the uh, um, further on this uh, on this type of direction, the Edmonton mayor uh, called for a ceasefire. The response of the Jewish Federation in Edmonton was to condemn this as basically as anti-Semitism call for uh, the city to adopt the IHRA, anti-Palestinian definition of anti-Semitism. Um, and so now they're defining uh, calls for ceasefire as, as anti-Semitism. Uh, in a much, much clearer example of anti-Semitism that never gets defined this way, Barbara Kay, the mom of John Kay and the long tan National Post report, uh, columnist, on Twitter, she says, she quote tweets somebody who's got an article titled saying, what makes Hamas worse than the Nazis? A very important piece by leading British historian and peer Andrew Roberts. So piece arguing that the Hamas is worse than the Nazis. And then Barbara K. Add says, also Nazis, quote, only wanted Jews of Europe dead. Hamas's extermination ambitions are global. <laughs> So this is a complete and utter whitewashing of the Nazis. This is Barbara Kay. Hamas wants Jews everywhere in the world uh, killed, whereas the Nazis, they weren't so bad. They just wanted European Jews, Jews to be killed. I mean, this is just outrageous, outrageous uh, 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 you know, whitewashing or, or, or uh, I don't know, Holocaust minimization or whatever you want to call it exactly. Uh, but this is, what's, this is what's out there. Right. This is a, a segment of the Zionist movement in Canada. Um, this is what they are. They are. Uh, they are putting out. Uh, we had the the uh, um, Hillel at the University of British Columbia uh, admit. So there were stickers that appeared a, a week ago or so saying "I love Hamas," and then they said uh, "UBC Social Justice Center." And it was this effort to say that the UBC Social Justice Center was just a, you know, Hamas propagandist or whatever. And, you know, anyone who knew anything about it knew this was, it was obviously not the UBC Social Justice Center put it out. But on Twitter, the pro-Israel types are all over. They're talking about the, these stickers all over. Oh, we proved it. They're, you know, and now it, it, Hillel admits that it was what they call one of their contractors that was responsible for these stickers. Um, that was obvious to me at the time that it was some pro-Israel force that was behind it. Uh, that's been proven I, and we'll see. I, I think um, as time goes on, as time goes on with a number of these incidents of, of, um, of uh, uh, what perceived to be uh, anti-Semitic attacks against Jewish institutions in Montreal, as time goes on, I'm of the opinion that the odds are that this was this was pro-Israel forces go up. Initially, I thought it was probably just somebody who was sort of a um, bit unhinged, kind of Palestine supporter. I thought there was a possibility it was uh, um, some far right forces that sort of I don't know, took advantage of the situation to you know put forward anti-Semitic kind of stuff. And I, I thought there was a possibility it could be some sort of like pro-Israel. Type trying to trying to demonize the Palestine solidarity world. Now the idea that it was a sort of unhinged pro-Palestinian supporter that diminishes if the police can't catch this person or persons. Um, that to me speaks to you know if you're if you're not really totally with it, presumably you leave some some traces of of you know what what what's happened. Um, the other part to it that I I hadn't really thought through and in my initial reaction okay it's a way of demonizing. Uh, 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 Palestinian supporters, but I think that the just as likely, or maybe more likely, 
is that you know after the 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 uh, Hamas attack of October seventh, there's a, created a lot of fear in Israel, and of course there's a lot a lot of Israelis who are dual passport. Um, uh, you know they can move back to Canada, drop of a hat, uh, or the U.S. And Israel, of course, is very concerned by that. Um, so it's not beyond the realm of the possible um, that that it would be you know actually you know Israeli government uh, uh, type of kind of type of initiative as a way of of sort of uh, scaring Canadian Jews um, and and. It, Canadian Jews that are in Israel to not, uh, you know, return to uh, to Canada, and of course for the Mossad, these types of operations would be very easy. This wouldn't this wouldn't be they, you know, could pull this kind of stuff off uh, without any difficulty. Now I don't have any proof of this. Uh, like I said, my initial reaction was the most likely scenario is that it was somebody who sort of viewed themselves as pro Palestinian in some way, and they're they, you know, did a, the, you know, a, threw a Molotov or. Uh, shot some shot some bullets in you know uh, synagogue, uh, Jewish school, whatever. That was my initial uh, thought. Secondly, you know some sort of far right type type force. Um, but I do think again, and with time, if no if no one is uh, uh, found out, I, I think you have to increase the the plausibility that it that it actually was uh, some way sort of like a a pro Israel type force uh, uh, behind it. Nevertheless, um, that's of course all very speculative. Um, nevertheless, uh, uh, I think I'll probably skip a few things. Um, and um, yeah, I guess I'll just conclude with this uh, a piece in the National Post by uh, Jerry Grafstein, who, who uh, um, he was a, a liberal senator. His dad was, I think, a minister in, in Trudeau. Uh, seniors government or he's they got long-standing liberal ties and it's titled dear justin trudeau rampant anti-semitism on your watch is shameful now his part of his conclusion to deal with all this is a what he says quote take all leaders of the opposition party with you to israel as an act of national unity as some mps have already done so all of our Canadian politicians should go to Israel as an act of national unity. That's the suggestion from this former liberal senator. Um, I, it's all a little bit confusing to me. Um, there were five uh, Canadian MPs uh, that went to Israel just in the last couple of days. House Father Sachs, who is actually a, a minister. She has a ministerial position in the, in the liberal government. And I think a one or two conservative MPs, uh, and they went to basically. Oh, also um, the other uh, Mended, Mendicino, the other Toronto Toronto MP. Um, and in the in the in the vein, I guess maybe of this national uh, unity uh, on Israel, uh, Jeff Ballingall, who is with the Canada Proud, who was hired. Uh, it's a right wing Ontario. Um, anti-liberal sort of pro-conservative party, I guess, activist type group. Um, uh, apparently he does lots of social media stuff. He was hired by uh, Pierre Poliev for um, the, uh, some of their, I guess, social media work for, for the, the Poliev. Um, he posted on Twitter a picture of a uh, bomb that his friend, I believe, had uh, written on it as the Israeli bomb that's about to be used in Gaza. And they, the guy wrote from Toronto with love. So that's what uh, Torontonians and these Poliev people are posting about is writing messages on uh, from Toronto with love on bombs that are gonna blow up uh, uh, Palestinian uh, uh, children. Um, and I guess that's the sort of national, you know, that's Canada proud for you. Um, I think I'll leave it there. And if uh, people have uh, comments, questions, I'll make uh, Laura a a um, uh, a uh, co-host. Okay. What, thank, thank, thank. Uh, oh, yeah, I think you're already a post. Thank, thanks everyone for the donations. They are are much appreciated for those who've uh, those who've donated. 
Was there a message about donations? Sorry, just that wasn't my question. No, no, I no. I just, I just, uh, I received uh, a nice donation today, and oh. I, so yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. No. Well, so I have a question for you because there are a couple of groups that uh, I wanted to ask you about in Canada who are so big in the U.S. in terms of supporting Israel and being all in on being against the Palestinians. So one is Christian Zionists, and I was wondering. I've always assumed they wouldn't be such a big force in Canada because I. I think, I could be wrong, but I think we're a more secular nation than the US. And the other group is the conservatives who are you know, very much against, many of them now against aid to um, Ukraine, but who are all in on aid to Israel, which uh, is disappointing to say the least. So I was just wondering, like, are you seeing that with the same tendency with uh, conservatives and also with um, you know, Christian Zionists in Canada? Well, it's important to remember that Zionism in Canada begins as a Christian Zionist movement, right? There, there is Christian Zionism decades before there's Jewish Zionism in Canada. Hmm. And I've written about that, talked about that. The preeminent uh, Zionist at the time of Confederation was Henry Wentworth Monk, who called for uh, a dominion of uh, the British Empire, like Canada was a dominion uh, of a Jewish homeland in the Middle East. And he actually set up called for uh, basically what becomes the Jewish National Fund, which is a um, you know, tool of uh, foreigners providing capital to colonize the land. Um, so, so if you go back in, um, at a time when Canada was more Christian, uh, there's lots and lots of like Christian Zionist rhetoric from, from top politicians. That's, you know, uh, and so, so uh, obviously Canada is much less uh, religious, much less Christian than it was 150 years ago, but there is still organized Christian Zionism. The, the most important element is a, you know, Charles McVetty, who's tied into uh, John Hagee's um, uh, U.S. Christian uh, Zionist uh, movement. They, he, McVetty runs the uh, Canada Christian College, which is... I don't think it's in Toronto proper. It's one of the it's one of the suburbs in Toronto, and they have events. B'nai B'rith used to do. I haven't actually seen that for recently, but um, tell a few years ago, they, B'nai B'rith did regular events, and they were they must they have must have some pretty big room because I saw stories about multiple thousands of people showing up to some of these events. Um, so there is still a Christian. I think it's like these numbers are dated, and I know that the evangelical um, um, sort of proportion of Americans that are evangelicals has actually been declining quite, quite, quite a bit in recent years. Sure. But but uh, ten years ago or so, I, I knew you used, you used to say that it was like like a third, maybe thirty percent of Americans that would would identify as being evangelicals, and uh, and now and at that point in Canada it was sort of like ten percent. Uh, so I don't know if those numbers are still. Um, totally up to date but but you know that's that's 10 percent is you know four million uh, people in canada if that's if that's you know uh, correct um uh and so the basic gist is that the more the more literally you read the bible the more uh zionistic you you would tend to be and that actually zionism begins as you know exists for a couple of centuries uh, as Christian as you know flowing out of the Protestant Reformation uh, in Europe before before you have uh, uh, Jewish Zionism. Um, so so yeah that that that's still a force. I think that's um, uh, that's relevant uh, force and, and and I think it gets wrapped up in being just sort of more settler colonialist, being more right wing, being more um, white supremacists, you know, sort of, and other things that I think are tied into uh, support for, uh, for Israel. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know, I forget, there was a, was there a second part to the... Uh... Well, I was just wondering about the conservatives that, like, you see many of them who are opposed to aid to uh, Ukraine, but they're all in on Israel, and they're just wondering if you're finding that in Canada as well. Yeah, I don't think you have the same... Um, the, the influence of 
the Ukrainian Canadian Congress and the much, much larger uh, Ukrainian community in Canada than the US, you don't, you, the, the, the conservatives weren't really in Canada criticizing on Ukraine. Uh, that, they, that, that doesn't, that's why the freak out has happened in, in the like last couple of days around not voting for the trade agreement, because it's possibly a sign of the conservatives kind of go in that direction. Where there are big, where the conservatives are strong in Canada is actually where the Ukrainian Canadian Congress is, is strong, which is in you know, Alberta, uh, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. Um, uh, I guess Manitoba may be a slightly less, but but uh, certainly Alberta, of course, being the you know hub of uh, conservative power in Canada. Uh, so so um, uh, that you know that didn't really exist. But yeah, I, I I mean I totally agree with you, and that's why Biden Biden connected the aid for Ukraine and the aid for uh, Israel uh, and then China and the border all in one package because explicitly to sort of um, not allow the the I don't know the MAGA Republican kind of milieu to to um, to uh, push back against the the Ukraine uh, uh, aid um, but uh, yeah okay so now uh, B Sandu go ahead please uh, yeah I, I just wanted to Eve build on the question uh, because of something that had bothered me a bit too in terms of you know, the whole Israel uh, support. And um, I did a piece on, it turns out that, you know, if you have more than 15, 5% uh, of a particular cohort in a writing and everybody votes uh, for a particular party, then they can actually swing that party, uh, sw swing that writing. So in Canada, there's uh, 13 writings which have the Jewish population is more than 5%. And majority of those are actually in the liberal camp. Uh, so that kind of explains to some extent, if you just look at sort of the politics of it, uh, you know, the liberal uh, position and they look at the NDP, uh, it has very little. And so hence it's able to, you know, belate it, but still come out and say we need a ceasefire. But the conservative question is not necessarily, at least in my kind of uh, analysis, much of a, uh, a Jewish, uh, attracting a Jewish vote as it is, in fact, the uh, evangelical or so-called social uh, conservatives. And uh, it's in fact uh, a lot more deeper than just you know, overall percentages. Uh, if you remember, particularly the case of um, Leslie Lewis, she actually ran against uh, uh, Pierre Poilier for the leadership of the conservative party. She's a deputy uh, uh, leader of the opposition. And uh, she actually has, she in, I think it was last January, this January started something called the uh, allies of Israel caucus group. And that group is aligned to a U.S. equivalent uh, with this. Basically, the agenda is very simple and very narrow, believe it or not. And that is they're striving to have a united Jerusalem as the forever capital of, of uh, Israel. Uh, the belief is that when Jesus comes down and he basically is, uh, Jerusalem has to be in the hands of the Jews at that time, nobody else. He will, of course, kill all the Jews and uh, elevate the, the faithful to wherever they go. So she is actually an architect of uh, and several others behind her. But I mean, she sits on the front bench and I'm not just making this up. You can actually um, do the research in the in the article that I wrote on the subject. And there, uh, why Ukraine versus uh, uh, versus uh Israel for the conservative is, is that they have a lot more at stake from Alberta, even Northern British Columbia, all the way up to, to I would say, Manitoba and so forth with that particular cohort, which is more than 5% in a lot of writings. So I think that's one way of looking at it. And more specifically, the fact that there is a political presence right in the front bench of the political of uh, Pierre Polyev's party, which is uh, Leslie Lewis, and she makes no bones about this. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot going on on this question. I mean, like, I think that there's five main elements to understanding support for Israel. Okay, there's a geopolitical element of controlling the Middle East, Israel as a U.S. 
uh, aircraft carrier. If you look at what Lester Pearson said on why he pushed for partition in 1947, uh, he brings it up, he repeats it again in the early 1950s. There is clearly a geostrategic element that Canadian planners, US planners have viewed Israel as an outpost of uh, European imperialism in the Middle East. There's a settler colonial, this is the settler solidarity element to it. There is a Christian Zionist element to it. There is a, a Jewish uh, Israel lobby element to it. There is the element of uh, the using anti-Semitism as a stick and the power of that, 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 that's part of it all. I was more of the opinion that the geostrategic kind of dimensions were more influential and until 2014. And in 20, and I write, if you read my Canada and Israel book, I mean, I go through all elements to it, but, but put more emphasis on the, the, um, the, uh, the geostrategic uh, element. I still think that is, so long as the American empire, Canada's like is, is pro-Israel, then Canada's gonna be, that's ultimately the most powerful. You can get into a question of why the U.S. Me. I didn't know you're out here. Why the U.S. So empire? You most, did. Oh, oh, there's a. Uh, I, I didn't get it. Try That's to, okay. Try I to mute. I'm, uh, listen. I'm listening to this evening. All right, there's one person really here good, who's not muted. Good podcast that's on or a know, live but, thing. I don't know how everybody got this. unmuted. We have a few. Really? I said, can I hear you? Again? Could you? Pl- I'm going to try to mute you and see if you're the one. Yeah, I don't know how some people got unmuted here. I, I, because I, I, I made a mistake. I, I turned off the oh. videos instead of the, the muting. I think in, in, at start. Oh. But, but so, okay. but, but basically, in 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 2014, when I was in, I was in Toronto, and it was during the bombing of Gaza, where there was the onslaught in Gaza, against Gaza, and and there were just like thousands of people. There was basically no Israelis killed. I can't remember the exact numbers right now. Um, but it was basically almost entirely Palestinians killed. And there were thousands of people mar- you know, rallying in favor of the killing. I'd never seen that before. I'd never seen that. And, and almost everyone there was Jewish. Um, and I changed my opinion. The level of, uh, of uh, emotional commitment that I saw for just like, didn't matter what, like I really felt like it didn't matter what, Israel did, and we're seeing that now, that it was going to be just like backing this to the to the hilt. And and um and so so I think that I, I put much more than I did in my Canada and Israel book in 2010. I put much more emphasis on the power of the pro-Israel Jewish organizations and, and lobbying forces in explaining it. I, I don't think that election narrow electoralism explains that. Right? I don't think it's just about the liberals wanting to win uh, a couple seats and, and stuff like that. That does that is a factor in in in, in these calculations. Uh, but it's 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 a there's no there is no um, ethnic or religious uh, uh, lobbying structure that comes even close to how well organized Sija, B'nai B'rith, uh, Honest Reporting Canada. Uh, Israel on campus, the Hillel's, the Jewish federations. Like I just saw that the Montreal Jewish Federation, uh, I saw the story, $414 million they raised in their most like annual whatever. I mean, this is a, like, you, you look at, you go look at the Ukrainian Canadian Congress, which is influential, but like, if you look at the amount of resources they have, it's nothing in the vicinity of what Sija and, and, um, and other forces. And then, and then the ability to pull out the anti-Semitism a stick alongside. So you have a situation where you have also like, you know, the, the, the part of explaining Harper's shift, the pro-Israel is the donors. And, and, um, and uh, they're pretty like, there's a globe piece from 2013 when Stephen Bronfman becomes, uh, talks about Stephen Bronfman being uh, the chief fundraiser for Justin Trudeau. And, and in the story, they point out that the, uh, a, a bunch of wealthy uh, Jewish donors who had tradition, traditionally donated to the liberals went over to the conservatives uh, because of how pro-Israel Harper was. And they quote Stephen Bronfman saying that, well, Trudeau, Har- at that point, I don't know if he has been since, probably has, but 
At that point, Harper hadn't been to Israel. And, and Stephen Bronfman saying, oh, but Trudeau's been to Israel. Like, sort of, he's the more pro-Israel type. And he completely linked his taking charge of the fundraising for the liberals uh, to the Israel question. And so um, now Canadian finance rules around elections are very different than the US. So the power of, of like fundraising in the US is just like infinitely more important in elections than it is in Canada, but it still has some, uh, uh, some uh, impact within, within Canada. So, you know, there's a many factors to, to explaining the, the, um, the pro-Israel. There's, you know, like I said, there's a Christian Zionist, there's a geopolitical, there's, um, uh, there's the settler solidarity, there's uh, uh, pro-Israel uh, Jewish organizations, there's the, which is tied to the pro-Israel Jewish organizations. There's the, you know, ability to, to uh, wield the, the anti-Semitism stick. Um, there's electoralism, but if you get into the electoralism right now, at this point, I think it's like a two, towards two million Canadian uh, um, Muslims. Uh, there are many fewer. I think it's like not. There's not that many Palestinians in Canada, but I I forget the number I saw somewhere. But there, but there's um, there, I think it's like uh, fifty thousand, fifty five thousand. I think I saw that recently. Um, Forty five thousand. Forty five thousand. Okay, yeah. And and so so you know the Jewish population is 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 greater than that. Um, but I think three fifty to four hundred thousand is usually the the numbers thrown out. Um, but uh, 365. <laughs> 365 yeah so 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 there's but, but, but the muslims muslims you have to be careful because the, the there's a cultural difference between religion and culture right so not all muslims are necessarily pro palestine or pro anything per se and not all and not all jews are, are fair are, enough <laughs> exactly exactly anyhow Okay, so yeah. should we go? Should we move on to Yuri? Just to let you know, Eve, we've got three people with their hands up now. So, do you have any kind of hard stop here? Yeah, I should try to be be quick because I have some parental duties to. to okay, to... go ahead, Yuri, please. Okay, uh, I'm going to skip one. I'm going to skip one question and 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 something that Ken uh, Stone of Hamilton Coalition wanted to uh, challenge Eve about the uh, statistics of how many people have been protesting. So, very quickly, Eve, then. Uh, I'm I'm just curious. Uh, Black Lives Matter and Indigenous and 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 you know the very broad Indigenous Lives Matter movement. I know that there are more. I know more and more Indigenous people are showing solidarity towards Palestine. I saw Des. I know L. Jones has shown solidarity to to a Palestine. Desmond Cole was even at the big Ottawa. Uh, protests but black lives matter the organization in canada have they been speaking out on palestine and then uh you know we were talking about the interesting dynamics of you know the kind of selective anti-war that's that, that's going on with the right wing i'm curious what's been the libertarian party of canada's position on uh, on yeah what's been going on in israel uh, curiosity yeah, I mean, I guess that kind of that's going in the direction, of Laura. I, I haven't seen uh, BLM Canada take a position, but I actually haven't seen BLM Canada be taking positions on on much. I, I don't know what, what what the formal organizational structure is. Um, I haven't seen any right wing uh, like libertarian kind of crowd in Canada uh, taking a pro Palestinian position. I haven't seen like Maxime Bernier necessarily engage in that, but I that, I haven't looked either. So so uh, what I what I've seen from what I take is these sort of like it's called the uh, um TR news or something like that. It uh, it's like a, like and you know, certainly rebel news, right? Like Ezra Levant, I think at one point Ezra Levant was um uh, he retweeted some of uh one of my uh, disruptions of Christian Freeland. Um, but he's totally pro-Israel, like hard. So the rebel yeah, news, very much so the, the rebel news crowd is kind of there. And, and other and there's another TRT or uh, anyways, I've got another media outlet that's kind of in that true north. True true north, north yeah, or something. North. yeah, that's in that vein. That's also seems to they're very anti-Palestinian. Um, so that's my that's my impression uh, on that. Okay, I'll keep trying to get Elizabeth to unmute. Elizabeth, can you unmute? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Go ahead, please. Okay. I am confused. 
uh, what is Jewish? Is it a religion or is it a race? Because during the Ottoman Empire, Jews had to be higher taxes. And a lot of Jews very sensibly converted to, to became Muslims. So many of the Palestinians are basically a Semites if as a race. So, yeah, I don't. I'm not. I'm not. Uh, definitely not an expert on that. And I know that's. There's lots of different opinions on that. Um, I, I usually refer to it, religion slash ethnicity, because there's varying opinions on it. But I, I don't. I don't have a clear answer so, on that. As so many Sinites Sen are basically converted Ukrainians and Russians. So basically, they're not really ethnic Jews. So basically, you will have Ukrainians killing ethnic Jews in Palestine right now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I know in uh, uh, Shlomo, Shlomo um, Sand, his book, uh, he argues that the, the, uh, the Romans, the, you know, the historical uh jews uh uh are the palestinians now right like the romans some people would have been driven out but most would have stayed and um uh and he's a pr prominent israeli uh um uh historian uh but uh yeah okay so eva that's it someone put their hand down I, at least i can't see them anymore maybe i'll just check the gallery no, I think they took their hand down. So thanks very thanks. much, Eve, and thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Take care. Next week. Good job, Eve.